Good morning, Crossing Church. Whew. It's going to be a rough one today. Um, I'm Jonathan, one of the pastors here at the Crossing Church. It's great to see everybody. Um, thanks, Warner. That was great. Um, <laughs> I didn't think it was going to be this tough. Um, so why? Why is God great? I mean, I'm sitting here listening to this, worshiping. Sadly, more listening than I am worshiping, right? I'm sure you guys, I'm sure we all find ourselves in that place, right? Um, but why? Why is God great? I, I think sometimes when we, when we hear that, we... Warner, you took all my, <laughs> everything I was going to say. <laughs> no, it's good, it's good, man. No, I mean, it's good. I mean, I didn't, I, I, <sighs> he's great because of who he is. And I think, um, <sighs> oftentimes we, we think he's great for what he does for us for answered prayers, for just incredible things, right? But it's not that. He's great because of who he is. Yeah, it's going to take forever. <laughs> uh, and I think we, uh, I think we all fall into that trap. I think we fall into this trap of thinking that you know, sometimes God's with us, sometimes he loves us, sometimes he doesn't, because sometimes our life is going good, and sometimes our lives, is go our lives are going bad, and, and so this, this fickleness, this swaying back and forth, we, we look to that, and, and somehow we take that, and we impress that upon God, both, both when he does good things and when he does bad things. He's unchanging. He's always good. He's always gracious. We're going to read this story this morning that shows just how incredible our God is, and, and, it's a, and it's a crazy story, and I hope that you guys are all familiar with Rahab, probably, and the story of it, but I, but I think that there's so much more depth to this that we, honestly, for me, it was like jaw-dropping, because I was like, wow, I didn't know this. <laughs> I probably should have known this, but I didn't know this, and it's incredible because it reveals just how incredible our God is. Um. You know, and I, and I, I'm not even on my notes yet, so <laughs> I'm just ranting. Uh, a year ago today, I died. Um, uh, well, I didn't have a heartbeat for like 15 minutes, but whether I was dead or not, <laughs> only God knows. But, um, you know, and it's sad because I look at that at times and I go, is that why God's good to me? Is that why I say, God, you're great? Because that's the first thing my mind goes to. But he was great before my accident. And he's great after my accident, right? Like, he didn't change. His purposes are so deep and so profound that, like, we... we and, and, I, and the sad part is, is I think when... I think oftentimes we think that something big, something grand has to happen in order for God's purposes to be accomplished. We think that like you got to stand on a stage or you got to be leading worship or you got you to have some incredible thing. And what we're going to see this morning is this incredible story of just relationships. Just people choosing to be loving. Um, just choosing to live as lights and... Um, glorifying God, and, 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 and it's incredible because I, I think we, we, miss, we miss that part. We think that there's so much more, right? We live in a society now where like, we can all become these famous people with just this, if it's just the right post. If I just record the right video on YouTube, like, this is going to be it. And, and honestly, for you parents out there, like, this is 
I mean, you grew up without this stuff, but like this is what your teenagers are probably thinking. This is what they're getting fed, right? Like they are just this close to fame. And they're just this close to influence. And what God tells us in this story is like, no, 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 you influence every person that you talk to. Every breath you speak as you go to work, as you go to school, whatever that is there, is, there is gospel moments in all of those things. And I'm not talking like, do you know Jesus? You know, like you don't have to change the conversation like that. It's how you live. It's how you react. It's how you deal with the circumstances of life. It's how you deal with what's going on right now. So we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. And we're going to read this story about Rahab. And as we've been going through this, the author of Hebrews is pointing to these different people. And he's going, this is faith. This is faith. This is faith. Right? Like showing these different aspects. And what we're trying to do is show you like these different, different sides to faith. Because it's complex. It's multifaceted. And this one is just straight crazy. <laughs> because what... Let's, let's read it. Hebrews 11.31. It says, by faith... Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Now, obviously, the author of Hebrews assumes that the people reading this know the story of Rahab, right? He doesn't really give a whole lot, but he does give one very glaring detail, that she's a prostitute. Like, I mean... Okay, so this is, this is what we're dealing with here. We're, we're going through Abraham, and we're going through all of these amazing people of faith. There's two women listed in here. One, Sarah, makes sense, right? Abraham and Sarah, like, like they, their children were the ones that the blessing was going to come through. Totally makes sense that she was in there. But, but now we have a Canaanite, non-Jewish prostitute. And the author of Hebrews goes, oh yeah, her too. This is faith. So this should cause us, when we read this, we go, Ugh, okay, I need to dig into this. And, and, and honestly, the more you dig in, the more you're like, this is getting muddier and muddier because I really don't like this. Because it's really challenging for us to see some of these facets of faith. It's very difficult for us to point to that and go, really, there's faith in there? Where was their faith? So I hope to be able to Reveal that to us this morning. So um, if you turn over to Joshua, we're going to spend more of our time in Joshua chapter 2. Um, and this is where we get to this story. Okay, so uh, BJ actually started talking about a little bit of it because they talk about the walls of Jericho, right? Like, like marching around Jericho, the walls fall down. This is, so Moses has died. Joshua has taken over. They're crossing the Jordan River, Jordan River to go into the promised land. And there's Jericho. Well, before the walls fall, before all of this happens, Joshua sends two spies to go into Jericho to go assess the situation, figure out, like, what are, we, what are we getting ourselves into, right? And they go, and as they sneak into the town, the king somehow figures this out, and he's looking for them. Well, they cross paths with Rahab, a prostitute. She lives in the city wall. That's not really, like... From a defensive perspective, you wouldn't want to be the one that has, like, your, your window on the outside, right? Like, I know now we think, oh, that's a beautiful view. Not so much when, you know, whatever weapons are coming back the other direction, right? So, so the riffraff of the town was really kind of on the city walls, and this is where she was. And so that's probably where they kind of, I don't, I don't know if they, it doesn't really say whether they scaled the wall and, like, walked into her window and was like, hey, how's it going, you know? So... We really don't know how they crossed paths, but they did. And so the king goes, and he's looking for these two spies. And he comes to Rahab. And we don't really know why he goes to Rahab. Um, maybe he, she was the tenth person that he had gone to. We don't know. But, but he goes to Rahab, and he goes, where are the spies? And she straight up just lies. So, all right, so here we go. <laughs> so we've got a lying prostitute now, Right? And, oh, by the way, like, treasonous. Like, she is, she is now, like, protecting their enemy. So this is all sorts of, like, weird stuff. Like, ethically, like, there's just, morally, there is, this is just muddy ground. And we're like, all right, we're going to get to faith somewhere in here. And so when she tells the king, she's like, I don't know. They came, yeah, they, they came in here, but then they left. I have no idea where they went. And the reality was is that she hit them up on the roof. And then she ends up sending them off and allows them to escape through her window. 
So this is the story. This is, this is what we go to. And at one point, we're going to see a little bit of this faith start to be revealed. So she hides them up. The king leaves. She goes up on the roof before the guys go to bed, and she talks to them. And this is what she says in Joshua chapter 2, verse 8. It says, Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us. And all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens, above and on the earth beneath. I'll keep reading here. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them. And deliver our lives from death. So this is this is what she comes up on the roof and says. Now, if if your Bible has uh, capital L O R D, like lowercase, that's the that's the name of God Yahweh in Hebrew. That was actually what was written in there. So she's not saying like. Your God is a God. In fact, the Canaanites had a bunch of gods. I mean, I, they had like 20-something gods. So it, would, it really wouldn't have been unreasonable for her to say, sure, your God apparently is more powerful than all these other gods, and he's just one, and you know, he's the Zeus of everybody else, right? It, it would be reasonable for her to go down that point. But see, there's a pivotal verse in here. In verse 11, It says, as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord, for Yahweh, your God, he is God in the heavens. In the heavens above and the earth. And like, he is God. Like, she somehow, she's heard these stories of what God has done. She heard about what, how, how the Israelites are moving and they're defeating all these people. And she hears about the crossing of the Red Sea. And and somehow, she has faith. This is, this is the pivotal point of this whole story. And this is what's interesting, right? It says that the whole land was afraid. Their hearts melted. They had no spirit left in them. But for her, that fear turned into faith. You see, they, they looked and they went, their God is great. Their God is amazing. Right? Their God is powerful. And the whole of Jericho, right? All these Canaanites, all these people that that didn't know Yahweh personally, weren't part of Israel or anything like that, all of these people were afraid because they knew the facts, and the facts were that this God was great. But they didn't have faith, they just feared. But Rahab, she feared. So you have kings, you have soldiers, you have all these people who are afraid of what's going to happen. And here's Rahab, lying, treacherous, treasonous, prostitute, living in the city walls, nothing to speak of from a, from a right? If you walked into Jericho, you go, bring me your, your finest, right? Like, she's not even on the list. And yet somehow... There's this faith. Somehow she gets this fear, this same fear that melts everybody else's hearts. And instead of fearing and defending herself, she puts herself before the spies and goes, promise me you'll save me. You see, I think this is, I think this is what, we, what we do. Right? Because what the people of Jericho knew in that moment was that their rebellion, was that their rebellion to God, their rebellion of this God, Yahweh, was going to result in their destruction. They knew this. They, their hearts melted. Like, but what do they do? 
Why? From a very practical matter, I'm a military guy. From a very practical matter, if you know you're going to lose, there's ways to kind of solve this problem. I wouldn't know because I've never surrendered or anything. But, um, sorry, yeah, stay on my script. All right. Um, why wouldn't they have just, I mean, if they're that convinced, if they're that afraid, why wouldn't they have just gone, hey, listen, <laughs> we, we saw what happened on the Red Sea. <laughs> We're good. Can we, can we be compatriots here? Can we figure out some, some solution, some symbiotic relationship between us and Israel? They could have done that, but they didn't. It's the same reason we don't repent when we find out about our rebellion. It's the same reason that when, when we get presented with us uh, this, this glaring picture of our own sinfulness, that what do we do? We defend ourselves. We defend ourselves. We go, well, it's not that bad. I mean, I mean here, here, here's why I do this. Here, here's why. Here's a rational. Let me, let me make this not as bad. And we, and we even go to God, or maybe we kind of ignore God, and we go, let me, let me defend my position in this. If your spouse, if you're married in here, probably your spouse has come to you and said, hey, I, I don't like this or something, right? And what's the first thing? Sadly, that comes out of this putrid heart of ours. Defense. I need to protect myself. I need to validate what I said, what I did. I want to justify it. You see, that that's the difference. That's the difference between faith that comes from repentance. This is Rahab going, I, I, I don't have an option here. And so for us, it's actually much closer because sadly, I think often we find ourselves in with the Canaanites here just defending what we've done. But here's the incredible thing. God knew Rahab before all of this had happened. The, the spies didn't just happen to run into Rahab and it ended up being a, a thing of opportunity or coincidence. That's not how our God works. Like This was a foreordained encounter and you think you're going to see this as we kind of progress through this story. But this is what, this is, this person, Rahab, this is the person that God chose. Out of all of Jericho, out of all of this rebellious, God chose to save Rahab. What did she do? I mean, when we read back through these other stories of these people in Hebrews, we go, okay, well, they did this and this and this, and there's some things. But Rahab, we got nothing. <laughs> there's, there's nothing worthy other than the fact that she, like, housed these spies, which, honestly, I, I'm like, it's a very pragmatic decision, right? Like, let's see. I die by the hands of the Israelites when they come in and destroy our city, which is about to happen. Or I might die from the king who might find out that I hid the spies. And she's just kind of making a decision a little bit, right? Like, it kind of seems very pragmatic of like, uh, I don't want to die, <laughs> right? Like, I'm going to go down this path. Like, I, I just don't know. Like, I, I, I read this, but if it wasn't for that statement when she goes up to those guys on the roof and goes, no, 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 your God is this God. And that's why it's included in here. And this is why Rahab is included. It's because she goes, no, this isn't just a pragmatic decision. I actually believe that your God is the God of the heavens. And this is why the author of Hebrews points to this. This is the kind of person that God saves. So if you're in here and you're thinking, oh, well, you know, I, well, let, me, let, me, let me ask you a rhetorical question. Do you deserve your salvation? Do you think you deserve your salvation? Do you sometimes think you deserve your salvation? I think, I think, I think some, some do, right? I mean, we, we, we know what the right answer is. No, I definitely don't deserve this. Maybe you're like, well, I mean, I'm a pretty good girl, I'm a pretty good guy, pretty good, right? Like, I, I'm a decent dad, I'm a decent father, I'm a decent worker. 
Sometimes we can find ourselves in this place. And, and so if you're in here and you're like, man, I, I've just struggled with this because I just don't fit. I just don't fit the model of what I think God expects. That outward appearance, right, that Warner was talking about, right? This, this outward appearance of like, who does God save? This. This is the person that God saves. This, there, there is no distance that God can't reach to rescue us. There is no sin too bad, no person too lost. God does this. This is his plan. This is, this is why we declare our God is so great, not just because of who he is, but because his love overflows to such an extent that he actually loves and cares for us. And then any rebellion that we have, he goes, I love you. I love you, and I sent my son to die, to cleanse you of those sins. There is now no rebellion for those who call themselves followers of Christ. The, the, the rebellion that we have and we repent of that, I mean, it's already been solved. God has cleansed us of this. And so we can go into the presence of God with confidence. This is what he does. This has nothing to do with the fact that, that she is a lying, treacherous, treasonous prostitute. It doesn't matter because God has forgiven her. John 7, 24, Jesus says, Do not judge by outward appearances, but judge with right judgment. You guys, this is... I, I know we say this and we understand these things, but let me just ask, do you act differently towards some people than others because of how they look, because of their political affiliation, because of their race, because of their language, maybe because of their personality? You're like, man, I just, just a lot of work. This person, and we've talked about this before. These, these people, man, they're just like me. <laughs> they're just like me. It's so easy. We just hang out. We all speak the same thing. We all, we all, we all hang out. Like, oh, we, we like the same things. We look the same. We talk the same. It's great. And we're all just kind of sitting in a room of mirrors. And God's going, I, I save everybody. I save everybody. There's no, there's no nation, no culture that he doesn't reach in and save. And yet here we are judging by outward appearances. And, and none of us would have picked Rahab. Would any of you invite Rahab into your community group? <laughs> Why? I, I wouldn't. <laughs> and that's the sad part, right? I go, man, that's just going to be a lot of work. She's so far. I'm not even sure. Like, and yet, sometimes, so often, we find that this, this faith, this repentance that's, that's not dictated by an outward appearance is residing there. This amazing faith that, that comes out in a conversation, and all of a sudden, you are confronted by your prejudice, and you're confronted because you're like, I had written off that person. And all of a sudden, out of them flows gospel truths, and you go, I'm an idiot. If there's a point to the story of Rahab, it's that we look and we go, man, God saves everybody. God saves every type of person out there. Like the, the, we didn't, we we have not figured out the solution. Like we, I cannot define for you what the saved person looks, sounds, acts like, other than they're living lives as lights for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, it's. What's interesting about it is that we, all of that, all of that frustration and confusion of, of us trying to figure out how a person like this, like, like we become judges, right? When we say, would, would we invite Rahab into our church or into our community groups, into our homes, and we go, man, I just don't know. We're becoming judges with evil thoughts. 
In fact, not only that, but we're, we are pretending as if our heart, our sinfulness, our rebellion is somehow not as significant. The gospel's clear that our hearts are wretched and pitiful and deceitful. All of us, none of us deserve to be saved. We are all in the same pit of despair. We all need to be rescued. None of us deserve to be saved. None of us deserved in the past tense to be saved. But God in his righteousness and grace just pours out his love. Why? I don't know why. Because he's an amazing God. Because he's a great God. Because he's gracious and loving. That should cause us to fall to our knees and go, everybody is welcome because we are all in the same situation. It says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul, Paul is talking about this going like, like do you understand that like, this is why Paul all the time boasts in his failures? He murdered people. He murdered Christians to stop them from spreading the gospel. And Paul wants people to know that. Because only when they know that do they know where he's come from. Only when they know that do they get to see the movement that was created by God. Only do they, when, they do, when they talk about that do we see God's grace. You guys, I think this is why we busy our lives with, with just life and junk and we, we just keep ourselves busy because we don't really want to spend the time connecting with relationships and investing in people and like actually being raw and real because when we do that we have to we have to start here we have to go this is my baggage this is my dirt this is the stuff that's nasty and we don't want to do that because we want to look good but in between here is the grace of God and so the more, the more we, we put on this mask, not that mask, the more we put on this mask and we try to hide the rest of this, we also hide God's grace in our lives. And so let me just encourage you guys, like, like as we live, man, we have got to be investing and like, and, and, and in those relationships. That is where the gospel is communicated. So don't think you have to be famous. You don't have to be on a stage. You don't have to be up here preaching or, or leading a community group or whatever. It's, man, it's, 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 it's the phone call. It's the text. It's the, it's the having relationships, encouraging each other. So what happens? So Rahab says, promise me you're not going to kill me. Well, if you fast forward to chapter 6, verse 25... Joshua says, um, uh, sorry, I guess I skipped another one. Anyway, Joshua 6.25, it says, um, But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Yes, this is, this is a very early foreshadowing of the gospel. It's, it's, well, it's really just showing the gospel that, that God has been in this business of adopting children. Okay, go to Rahab, right? Like, she, she asks the spies, will you save me? And they go, yeah, sure, we'll save you. You think as like they're raiding and, and her, her father and her mother and her brothers and sisters are, are there in the room with her and they all get saved. Do you think they're thinking, what happens next? <laughs> all right, so our town's going to be decimated. We're not going to have any friends. It's just going to be us. And then I'm sure the Israelites are just going to keep going, right? Like, what, what, why, would they, why would there be any sort of anticipated relationship or anything like that? And yet, that's not what God does. This, you guys, this is like, it, this is just such an incredible part of this because she doesn't ask for this. She just asks to be saved. And what does God do? He goes, no, no, no. You're going, to be, you're going to be adopted children into Israel. And when this is being written, they are still living in Israel. Could you imagine? 
Maybe you can. Depends on your situation. But could you imagine living as foreigners in the midst of Israel? What would that have been like? You think everybody would have been like, oh, come on in. Come on, we love us some Canaanites. Teach us about all your other gods. Oh, by the way, what do the Canaanites do? Child sacrifice. Honestly, Rahab's profession probably wasn't frowned upon. <laughs> it was probably a pretty substantial uh, profession there. So, so how, how do you think Israel would have met with that? How would they have dealt with that? You think there would have been some people who were like, I, I want them as far away from my house as possible. I think that probably would have been the, the going mindset. And yet God brings them in. He says, they're going to live here. It's this beautiful picture. And we actually read of it in Ephesians 2.19. If you, you can, you don't need to turn over there, but if you uh, write it down maybe in the margin. This is when uh, Paul is talking about the children of Abraham and Sarah. And he says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You guys, unless you're, unless you're Jewish in here, we have all been engrafted into God's people, right? Like, we have been brought in. We, hopefully, you don't sit here and think about, like, you know, your, your, your uh, genealogy to determine whether God has decided to save you or not. Because that's not, it's no longer part of it. He engrafts people. This is the gospel. This is the good news that it doesn't matter who you are or where you've come from. It is all contingent upon our faith in Jesus Christ. And so what he does is he, he actually promises this to us, just like he promised it to Rahab. Man, I, if, if there's a picture of our lives right now, it's this idea of like, it's Rahab and her family coming into Israel. There's this us versus them mentality. Had to have been. Don't, I mean, is that what we see today? And, and we, the, the church is no better. There's this, there's this angst in us. I mean, you could, you could be arguing about mask wear. You could be arguing about any sort of political topic that I'm not going to talk about from up here. But like, like anything, and all of a sudden, we hear, we see, we... we Maybe we see somebody post something or we see somebody not post something or we, we hear somebody say something and we go, we, we write them off. We write them off. And we go, I know what their motivations are. I know what their intentions are. I know exactly who they are. No, you don't. We don't. I guarantee you that's what Israel did to Rahab and their family. I know exactly who you are. I know exactly what you've done. I know exactly what you think. And yet the author of Hebrews points to her and says, that's faith. Why are we so quick to write off people? Why are we so quick to assume we know people's motivations? I don't care what side of it you're on. If you're on a side and it's not God's side, you're wrong. I mean, that's just the reality of it, you guys, because God, guess what? On both sides of the aisle in the U.S., people are saved, right? Okay? Not only that, hey, does anybody know how the elections are going in Somalia? Exactly. We, we have such a small focus. I'm glad nobody knew. <laughs> I don't even know if there are elections. <laughs> but like, we have such a small view. We think this is it. We think this is like everything that matters. And God's like, this is, who won the election in 1932? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Was it the greatest election ever? It was fundamentally going to change the course of history. And yet, the gospel is the same. Our God is still great. Woo! Right? So let's just fast forward here. So Rahab in Israel, marries a man named Salmon. He's an Israelite. Somehow, he apparently 
saw something, right? He didn't marry her, right? Like, like it, that, I don't even know how that marriage would have gone down, right? Like, they probably didn't get to get, have the whole ceremony. Probably their, their relatives and all that stuff from, from Salmon's family probably didn't come because he was marrying a Canaanite, a prostitute. I'm guessing the wedding wasn't, like, a beautiful thing. But Salmon, he's not even mentioned hardly anywhere. Matthew 1.15, I think that's it, right? Like, why? Why did he marry her? What a, oh. Setting himself up for a, 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 just a chaotic life, right? It would have been so much easier for him to just marry an Israelite girl. But he doesn't. See, he wasn't looking in a mirror he was like, oh, let me, let me go, let me, let me go and let me, let me look at people and, and love people well that maybe don't think just like I do. Maybe, maybe people who don't have the same experiences I have had. And so he crosses this and he marries Rahab. And they have a child. And this is, this is why when we, when we read these stories, man, if we, don't, if we don't keep digging, like we don't get to see this beautiful thing. And I did not until like two weeks ago. They have a child, and their child's name was Boaz. Do you guys know who Boaz was? So here's Boaz. He's in Israel. His parents, his mom's a Canaanite. His dad's an Israelite. And he sees this girl out in the fields just picking up trash, basically whatever she can scrounge. She's a Moabite. She's not an Israelite either. What does Boaz do? Same thing his dad did. Same thing his dad did. Yes, get that. If you're a parent in here, please get that. I don't think he lectured his son. I don't think he sat down and went, always marry a foreigner. <laughs> That's not the lesson, right? So Boaz marries this girl, and you can read about it in the book of Ruth. He marries Ruth, and they have a child. His name was Obed, and his son was Jesse, and his son was David. And through that came the Messiah. What I want you guys to get out of this is like, like it's, it's about relationships, you guys, like, like, just by virtue of, of how the spies interacted with Rahab and how Rahab interacted with them, and then they got engrafted into Israel, and then whatever that dynamic was between Salmon and, and Rahab, like, it's about relationships. It's about parental relationships. So, don't, none of these people, you know, we hardly even know these people's names. None of them were famous. In fact, they were probably more notorious than they were famous. And yet God is using this. God uses our lives. You guys, he doesn't have to do some sort of amazing, miraculous thing. He just wants us to live faithful lives as lights for the gospel and season every conversation we have with salt. It doesn't matter where you work. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter if you're staying at home, if you're, if you're going to school. It does not matter. If you overlap, if you have a conversation with another person, there's an opportunity for you to share the gospel. There's an opportunity for you to show love. That's God's plan. That's how he does all of this. Now let's just go back. Why is God great? Because these are the stories. These are the stories of his interaction in our lives. This is how he works. He isn't just some God that's, you're saved, you're not. You're saved, you're not. It's not like that. It's this incredible, beautiful story that somehow we get written into. And we get to be partners with God. You guys get that? That's why our God is great. Because he is unchanging. And he allows us 
to just participate, to love others well. Let me pray.